Hi there, and welcome on uh, YouTube, and I think on X, and even Facebook. Uh, we've got an interview today with Coach uh, Bronson. He's been on my channel once or twice before, uh, but he's always got a lot to say. And uh, in between times, he had a little bit of a moment where he wrote a book, a very short book, you know, didn't have much detail or references in it. So we want to talk about that as well. So anyway, Coach Bronson, hiya. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me on, Stephen. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, you're always good value. Um, one thing I thought was quite interesting about, might have been about six weeks ago, was I noticed you did a short with um, your better half, I should say. And uh, you were saying, why is nobody talking about the sugar diet? Uh, and we had been. <laughs> I no, had you been. guys have been. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw you like maybe right before that you had done one um, and you've talked about it a few times, you and, and Richard have talked about it and other people have, you've done a handful of, of yes. talks about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I, and at this point, I don't It's like, I love to talk about it. I don't, I just don't know. Is it a dead horse at this point? Is it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, even looking at some of the stuff that Mark Bell has been putting out lately, he's starting to backtrack from some stuff, right. Talking about, how he's now included more protein. He's not doing simple, simple carbs anymore. Like just, it's like not nothing that surprises us or that we didn't know was going to come, mm. right? As you, you know, as people start realizing, hey, if unfortunately, if all we're worried about fat loss, yeah, there's a lot of ways to lose fat. That doesn't mean there are healthy ways to to, to live, and they're not they're long term lifestyle solutions. So, yeah. Well, my big argument was well, not an argument as such. But um, you could literally go into a group of seven-year-olds and say, here's a diet. It's soda, it's candy, it's Sour Patch Kids, <laughs> it's putting sugar on melons. Okay, little children of seven. Is that a healthy diet? Right. <laughs> I don't think one would think it's healthy. Um, I think everybody knows it's not healthy. But yes. and, that, and that's where the trap is. Mm. Because... If we really listen to what anybody's saying, nobody's actually saying that it's healthy, but yeah. they are saying it's the best way to lose weight. And mm -hmm. that's where, that's where the challenge, that's where the trap comes into play. Because unfortunately we still in society look at weight as a marker of health, as the marker of health. And it is a part of the story, but there's so much more to it. That when yes. we focus specifically on that, and that's the only thing we're ever talking about, it just throws everything else out the window. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I, maybe I was being a bit facetious there, but there were people thinking of changing their diet and the way they were eating based on that. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, it's going to be a kickstart. It's going to, it's going to, I'm going to get the weight off. And it's like, well, um, don't forget you're damaging your body with this. You're glycating. Absolutely. Yeah, glycate in your body. Yeah, your fructose. I mean, even if you look at fructose, which is seven to 11 times more glycate than glucose, there was a lot of fructose going in there. So your hepatic cells are going to be tanking and their ATP concentrate. Anyway. Well, right. and inflammation and oxidative stress and just all of the other things. And I'm glad you mentioned the glycation because it's not even just a fructose thing. It's a blood sugar regulation thing. Mm. And your blood sugar is doing this all the time. You, at the tops and at the bottoms, your body just doesn't know what to do and it throws everything out of balance. So we talk about blood glucose, we talk about glucose management and we think about A1C. Um, and one of the things I wanted to come on here specifically and talk about was um, an area that I don't hear enough people talking about. And now that we have CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, and we have the ability to start tracking this new metric, because it is a new metric really, Mm -hmm. Um, and that is glycemic variability. So talking about the impact of the swings yes, and how damaging that actually is to our bodies. And I've got three or four different studies that I've been looking through, um, listening to a bunch of, new, of newer information because CGMs are fairly new in the, in the grand scheme of things. And what we can do with that and the benefit that we get out of it, a lot of people think about, oh, I'm just looking at trying to make sure you know, my blood glucose, my A1C stays down, um, trying to determine or uh, uh, evaluate where my insulin might be based on my blood sugar. And we start looking at what food is going to impact my blood sugar. What we're not thinking about is, and there's a, a new measurement. It's, um, what is it? It is the, hold on. 
I've got it right here. The mean amplitude of glycemic excursions, which I don't know if you've yes. heard of or other people have heard of, but I need, I, I, I like, I want more people to start talking about this because based on the data that we have, the swings of the highs and the lows of your blood sugar is being seen more broadly as having more damaging impact than A1C. Oh, yeah. So if you have an A1C, even if your A1C is six, if you have a high mage, mean amplitude of glycemic excursions, which means your swings above your average, your swings up and your swings down above your average, if there's a lot of them and they're really high, even if your average is a 6.0, if your average is a 5.5 for A1C, if your variability is high, you are at a higher risk of cancer, glycation, injury, inflammation, all of the chronic issues that we have, um, insulin sense, insulin resistance, all of those things are actually at a higher risk when your variability is high versus just looking at your overall totals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, th this is something I have talked about for so long. Uh, I, I bore myself hearing, hearing myself saying it again, but... <laughs> You know, firstly, when you look at an average, if you and I'll use really round figures just so people get this. If your average over 24 hours is 100 milligrams per deciliter, was that achieved by it being 150, then down to 50, up to 150, uh -huh. down to 50? Da -da. So that that's what we're talking about. Or was it 105, 95, 105, 95? And right. your average, you could say at the end, well, that's great. My average is 100. That's totally irrelevant, actually. What you just said is important. Uh, what happened throughout the 24-hour period. Secondly, you could also have a good blood glucose reading, but you don't know how much insulin it was required to give you that good blood glucose reading. So you could be saying, wow, it doesn't matter. Let's go to English numbers now. Let's say, oh, it's 4.6. That's fantastic. Well, how have you got 4.6 millimoles per litre? Did you need a lot of insulin? And this is one of the things because I did, a, you know, a decade with private, uh, private lab doing blood testing. We could see that actually you did need to know your insulin as well. What was your insulin level that achieved this great reading? So you could be sitting there thinking, well, my blood glucose looks great, which is me. It's my story. I got into my 40s. I was, you know, I believed all the high carb stuff. Um, and I thought I was doing really well, and then it all hit me. Everything caught up with me. Well, if I'd have been able to measure my insulin 10 years previously, I would have known, wow, I'm I'm needing a lot of insulin to get these results from my blood glucose. It's, it's mm -hmm. incredible. So, yeah, I think – is this mentioned in your book, by the way? This is not, because this is something that just over the last, I don't know, six months I've been really digging into. Um, the The stuff in the book – is much more what's the, it's it's well let's just talk about the purpose of the book so the latest book body confident i'm assuming that's what you're talking about is yeah. really more about um self-coaching mm -hmm. it's about understanding the the aspects of what the minimum the minimum requirements for success are in mindset fitness and nutrition how to identify where you are in your journey and then giving people kind of a framework to where they can step back if they're stuck and say, okay, here's where I am. Where do I, how, what's the basics I need to look at to get back to the basics and then build off from there again. Cause a lot of times we get down the road, we have a lot of success. Um, we may be stuck at a certain area. We get comfortable, we get content where we are, or we get sidetracked. We start doing the sugar diet or we start doing some other fancy thing or think something we think is going to speed us up. And in, invariably it gets us off track. Um, so just kind of, how do I get back to the things that I know are going to work? Very focused on minimum effective dose, very focused on shifting our mindset and the way we talk about our journey from what's the best way to do something to what is optimal or adequate for the individual. And we don't talk about that. We talk about rules and guidelines and how much should I have? There is no, there, nobody can tell anybody what they should have. Only the individual, based off of the results that they see when they do something, can determine what's going to be better for them. So you you have to start with what's the minimum you need, and then you work from there. 
And a lot of people are getting way more than they need or not enough for what they need because they're following a random guideline or recommendation or watching somebody and someone throws a number out there and then they say, okay, well, that's what I need to be doing because Peter Atia said, this is what I need to do. So I'm going to do it all the time. Right. And it's like, guys, that, that's not how this works. So I originally started writing the book as a book for coaches because what we do is blowing up as a business, right? As an, as a, as a market, as a, um, a job that people are, are assuming people, more people and more people, the, the coaching industry is exploded over the past 10 years. And there's a lot of people who are, let's, what's what I'm looking for following what they learned without having the experience to apply what actually works. So I wanted to kind of help give coaches the framework to say, look, when you're working with a client, how do you look at what's going on with that client and make sure that you're doing what's best for that client and not have to have a cookie cutter plan that every client you work with follows the same thing every time because that doesn't work. And if you really want to yeah. give individual success, you have to look at the individual. Um, and then as I was writing it, I was kind of like going through, I was like, Hey, you know, everybody needs this. Right. My mm -hmm. job as a coach, you know, I realize my job as a coach is not to uh, keep you working with me indefinitely. My job as a coach is to educate you as a client so that you can go out and be free. Freedom in the, for your life as a client includes freedom from having to have a coach. Mm. You should be able to go out and make your own decisions and evaluate the situation you're in and look at what you're trying to do and make a decision that's going to keep you where you are or, or move you forward. So being tied to a coach isn't any, isn't any more free than, you know, the other things you may be trying to, to develop in your life. So that's why I changed it. And it's for everybody, right? Coach yourself, learn how to do it, learn what works, figure out what the basics are. And as we all know, the basics and the boring things are what actually get things going. So. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm having a bit of a problem here because it's not streaming live to YouTube. Oh, wow. And um, I'm in on my own and my dog is panicking me. So what I might do is I might stop this, if you don't okay. mind. <laughs> Make yeah, sure no, my dog's fine. okay. And set it up to go to YouTube properly. Is that okay? Okay. All right. We can do so that. I'm going to stop this now for a second. Just start it over. I'm sure there's people on YouTube waiting. <laughs> 